Okay, so we have about 127 people in the room for the, the next keynote. So everyone is very welcome. Um, I know some of you have been very active in the uh, chat space in the last session. So please feel free to carry on doing that um, and write comments or pose questions that you might like the speaker to consider. Please also remember that we have an app for the conference and there are lots of um, facilities on the app that you can make use of during the, the keynote or, or afterwards. Okay, so um, this uh, keynote is called Nurses in Europe, a vital resource for universal health coverage and probably is well positioned following on from our previous keynote by uh, Dr. Walter DeCaro. So it's my um, pleasure to, I guess, first of all, um, introduce or reintroduce myself. My name is Professor Jan Dewing and I have the Sue Pendry Chair at Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh in Scotland, although at the moment I'm in my home in the south of England. This is not my home, not my uh, work office, it's my, in, in my home. And um, I am also the president of Omega Z chapter at large in, in Scotland and delighted to be uh, becoming more active in the European region. So um, just to add to everybody else um, who's spoken this morning, congratulations to the European region, to uh, the conference planning committee and to our hosts today. It's great to be with you virtually in Portugal, although I really was looking to being there, looking forward to being there physically, um, having uh, seen all the wonderful videos of your city and of your university. So we are staying pretty close to home because our next speaker is um, Portuguese. I'm delighted to introduce Professor Ananda, Ananda Fernandez, who is uh, currently Professor of Neonatal, Pediatric and Transcultural Nursing at the Nursing School of Coimbra and also a re researcher at UI UNESCO in Europe. And um, I find that combination of um, neonatal paediatrics and transcultural nursing really fascinating. And that should give a really interesting perspective on her presentation today. So Ananda is also is director of a, a World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Nursing Practice and Research. She's president of the special interest group on pain in childhood. Um, and um, part of an international association for the study of pain. She's also a member of the coordinating uh, core group for the National Programme for Prevention and Control of Pain. And she holds a PhD in nursing from the University of Lisbon. Um, anybody who's interested in um, Professor Fernandez's um, uh, portfolio can uh, look her up. Very, um, she has an extensive presence on um, the internet so you can search for her there to find out more information. So I'm delighted to hand over now to Professor Fernandez. Well thank you so much uh, Jen for your uh, introduction. Um, good morning, well good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening depending on where you are. Uh, to everyone my warmest greetings to all the colleagues around the world who are connected right now to us. And uh, I feel very privileged to be here today. And I would like to thank the organizers of this conference and the persons of Professor uh, Lourdes Lomba and her team, uh, as well as Sigma um, European coordinators for granting me this uh, opportunity. Never uh, in the last uh, few months, uh, I shall um, start uh, sharing my presentation. Um, okay. So never in the last few months uh, have we uh, heard uh, so much uh, about uh, nurses and so strongly about uh, nurses and heard nurses themselves. 
Um, it is as if uh, there was a sudden awakening for the fact that there are nurses. Uh, news, interviews, documentaries, public recognitions and uh, thanks, expressions of solidarity and gratitude have multiplied in the media all over the world. Uh, like I said, as if there was a sudden awakening to the fact that nurses are indeed the backbone of the health system everywhere. And backbone, as you know, is the term used by the Director General of the World Health Organization. But uh, let there be no illusion. Nurses have always been there. In the front line of the daily toil of every human being, uh, trying to maintain or recover good health from birth to death in every important moment of the life of people. It is, in fact, the media who have been forced by this absurd reality of the pandemic to highlight the role of nurses and health professionals in general. Just as well, it fits in the year of the nurse and the midwife, as decided by the World Health Assembly, coinciding with the bicentenary of Florence Nightingale and, last year, and the last year of the Nursing Now campaign. So for this lecture about nurses in Europe, uh, I have used documents and statistics that are publicly available from WHO and OECD and other uh, entities. And my job has been uh, made a lot easier with the recent publication of the State of the World's Nursing Report. Um, sorry, I'm trying to deal with the... So I will try to make the case that invent, investing in nursing gives good return by leading you through three main questions. I do not promise to give an answer to every uh, one of them, but I hope to leave you with some discomfort and also with some clues. What does it take to have a well-functioning health system? Uh, we know that a well-functioning health system responds in a balanced way to a population's needs and expectations by improving the health status of individuals, families and communities, by defending the population against what threatens its health, by protecting people against the financial consequences of ill health, by providing equitable access to people-centered care, and by making it possible for people to participate in decisions affecting the health system. Uh, and we clearly see, we have seen, and uh, thank you, Caro, for the wonderful presentation you did, uh, we can see what happens when health systems are not prepared to face unpredictable threats. So the key components of a well-functioning health system are leadership in governance, health information systems, health financing, human resources for health, essential medical products and technologies and service delivery. And I have highlighted the human resources for health because um, this is, I'm sorry, um, this is what we will be focusing on during this presentation. So the three questions that I have uh, to lead this um, talk are, first of all, who is a nurse? 
from qualifications and titles to competencies. The second question is nurses, what for? And the third one is, what is the next move? So, the question, the first question sounds quite silly, doesn't it? We are all nurses. We know very well what it is to be a nurse. But when it comes to governments, health policy makers, health services planners, administrators, the media, society in general, it's a different story. How can health systems be managed, planned to adjust to the needs of the populations they serve, if there isn't a clear understanding of the different professions that compose the human resources in health? When you try to count down the nurses, the number of nurses in a certain country, guess what? You can't know what is being counted. Registered nurses, professional nurses, nurse assistants, nurse associates, professional uh, uh, assistants, auxiliary nurses, healthcare assistants, WHO, OECD, Eurostat use the International Labour Organization International Standard Classification of Occupations, ISCO 8. But occupations must not be mixed with qualifications. So it is often hard to interpret statistical data in order to plan and forecast the nursing workforce. In addition, are we counting only, only those who are practicing or those who are licensed to practice? Do we include those who are professionally active? Meaning like I am a nurse, I have a license to practice, but in fact I'm teaching. So I am not um, counting to the effectives in the health system. Um, do we count individuals or do we count full-time equivalents? Finally, what about midwives? Do they count as nurses? In some countries, such just France, Belgium, Bulgaria, these are two separate professions, but in others like Portugal, Spain or Norway, midwives are specialized nurses. So are they in or not? Data collected at national level on the health workforce vary depending on the source, whether the Ministry of Health, Nursing Association or other entities. And different entities use different criteria to count. So data tend to be fragmented, incomplete and not comparable within, with other countries because of the lack of agreement on the professional categories under analysis. It wasn't until 2012 that the European Federation of Nurses Association agreed on the EFN nursing care continuum shown on your right, um, allowing for a more accurate collection of data based on the different roles of four categories in nursing care, therefore contributing to assist policymakers to advi advance the mindset on how to collect comparable data for workforce planning and forecasting. EFN advocates that um, only by using a terminology that can be understood at EU level by politicians, opinion formers and researchers will it be possible to plan and forecast the future nursing workforce adequately and to deliver safe and high quality health services in continuously reforming health systems. This terminology, however, is still not in use. So now that I have told you all the limitations or most of the limitations of the current data about the nursing workforce, let us move on to know more about nurses in Europe. Being a nurse in different European countries um, means that you will have different titles, 
of course related to the language and to the historical root of the word, which says a lot about the way the profession started and developed in a certain cultural context, but we will not go into that today. Uh, rather, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that differences exist in education to obtain the qualification and the nurse title. Uh, and we will come back to this. There are differences on the way that the profession is regulated, whether it has attained a certain level of self-regulation through an independent professional body who delivers the license to practice or whether it is regulated by the state. Another difference relates to the continuous professional development system. Is there further education for nurses after their basic qualification, such as a specialization or further academic degrees? Finally, big differences exist in the setting in which nurses work. In some countries, nurses only work in hospitals and only nurses in hospitals are counted, and in some long-term facilities as well. But in other countries, and increasingly, nurses have roles in primary and ambulatory care and home care. So it depends mainly on the specific health system and the specific health policies in a certain country. In the European Union, we have a directive that regulates the mutual recognition of professional qualifications in the European Union by indicating the title used in each country for a particular profession. Well, medical doctor, architect, engineer, and two professions are of interest to us in this directive. The nurse responsible for general care, that's how it's called, and the midwife. In most countries, there are health care assistants and nurse assistants, but this category is not regulated at European level. So, um, Let's look at nurse profiles in different countries. Um, sorry, let's look at the different titles. And I will invite you to search for your own title in your own language and guess where the different titles come from. I have highlighted the Portuguese title. It's called Enfermeiro for a man and Enfermeira for a woman. The nurse workforce in different country, countries dif differs in the education they get. The nurse responsible for general care in some countries will have a diploma and in other countries it will have a bachelor of nursing. And in some countries both nurses exist. But in general, uh, although there is an increase, uh, a trend to increase the number of nurses educated at the academic level, uh, in most countries, the entry level, either for the diploma or for the degree, uh, is two years, 12 years of secondary education, although in some countries still there are eight to nine years at the entry level, and the duration of the degree is three to six years, depending on where you are. For instance, in Germany, less than 3% of nurses hold a bachelor degree. Whereas in other countries like the UK, the Scandinavian countries and Portugal, uh, all nurses have an academic degree from a higher education institution. Now, nurses are the largest occupational group in the health sector. According to the State of World's Nursing Report, 59% uh, of the workforce in health are nurses. 
uh, the global nursing workforce is 27.9 million, of which 19.3 million are professional nurses. Professional nurses and profession, professional assistant nurses. And in the WHO Europe, European region, it is estimated that around 7.3 million nurses and midwives exist. And in the EU, there, is around, there are around 4 million nurses. These numbers, uh, no matter how you count them, they are insufficient to uh, respond to the needs, to the growing needs in Europe. This is not moving and I don't know exactly why. I'm sorry, I can't seem to move my... PowerPoint. Okay, seems fine. Thank you. So, are you all right, are you all right there, Amanda? Yes. Uh, okay. Is it? Uh, uh, you can see the slide, right? Yes. Okay. It was blocked for a while. I don't know why. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, but uh, they haven't blocked it. Apparently. Okay. Sorry for that. So there are large variations on the density of nurses per population. And in the previous slide, we could see uh, the density of nursing personnel per 10,000 population in 2018. And the red is where you have less nurses, and the dark blue is where you have more nurses. So when you look at the European region, you could say it is quite well served. And yet, there are large differences, even within the European region. Germany, for instance, has twice as many nurses as Portugal. Don't forget that we are counting in Germany uh, both diploma and bachelor nurses. And in Portugal, you're only counting bachelor nurses because they're, all the nurses have a bachelor degree. Uh, but Greece has half the nurses, as Portugal. So again, there are differences, but these differences also depend on what is being counted. Whether just nurses or nurses associate, associate nurses, or nurses and, and midwives um, who come from nursing, they will be included. There are large variations. Uh, to have an idea about the nurses' profile, we have in the European region an aging workforce. Nurses over 55 years or over are quite numerous. And countries with a high number of nurses close to retirement age need to increase the number of graduates in order to promote, uh, in order to uh, maintain access to health services and to promote retention. Now, one in 10 nurses is a male in Europe as in most of the world. Uh, yet, only 25% of leadership positions are held by females. This emphasizes the need for policies that increase and enhance nursing leadership and encourage female participation at leadership level. Also, as salaries for women in general continue to be lower than those for men, nurses and the nursing professionals receive lower payment 
than employment than employees in comparable public services that are more male dominated. Now in this slide, you can see another feature of the nursing workforce in Europe. And it is the mobility across countries. So it is not just about uh, nurses coming from uh, Asia, from Africa, uh, from South America to uh, high income countries. It's also about international mobility within Europe. Uh, this mobility is increasing with significant effects on the pool of nurses in uh, one country. Reasons for migration include availability of jobs, higher salary, better working conditions, hospital resources, and further education opportunities. A higher standard of living may also be an incentive, as well as the possibility to move with the family. This illustration comes from uh, a newspaper and sustains a positive correlation between health expenditure and the income of health workers. So whereas uh, uh, the income means the flow of health workers from one country to another, whereas countries who spend less in red and pink, who, has, who spend less in um, health, uh, they see their graduates immigrate and there is a clear movement from left to right and uh, sorry from east to west and from south to northern Europe. Okay. Uh, so in this slide you can see that 73,000 nurses from EU countries apply to work elsewhere in the bloc between 1997 and 2006. And you can see what are the countries that are sending and the countries that are receiving. On the left you have the sending countries and you can see that there are there is no reciprocity. For instance Hundreds of Portuguese nurses are leaving the country, but very few are actually coming in. Romania, for instance, and this is not just about nurses, physicians also have the same, um, the same uh, phenomenon. Uh, Romania, in this period of time, saw their physicians uh, cut by half because of migration. You can also see that, uh, as in, just as an example, uh, two countries who are very attractive uh, to nurses, Switzerland and Germany, um, you have the numbers between 2015 and 2019, and you have the countries that are moving to Switzerland and to Germany. So you have France, Germany, Italy, Portugal, Romania going to Switzerland, but you have totally different countries, Romania, Poland, Croatia, Italy and Hungary going to Germany. And this is also interesting. So let's move now that we have, um, now that we have a picture about who nurses in Europe are, let's move to the next question. Health in Europe, what do we need nurses for? We know that nurses in Europe face very specific challenges. There are growing inequalities between countries and within countries. As an example, you have a 22 year difference in life expectancy 
between the country with the lowest expectancy for men and the country with the highest expectancy for women in the WHO European region. Another example is that people with a low level of education can expect to live six years less than those with a high level of education. There is also a social gradient, that is, the lower an individual's socioeconomic position, the worse their health. Another example is that at least one in six adults are obese across EU countries with wide disparities by socioeconomic status. Access to healthcare is also very different because health systems are different and health policies are different. Another example is the healthcare entitlements for undocumented migrants in Europe. Uh, and Europe here is represented by the EU 27 plus Switzerland and Norway. So you have countries where everything is covered, like France or Portugal. You have countries where only emergency and hospital care are covered, like Italy. You have countries where only emergency care is covered. So there are uh, many uh, differences in, um, in the different countries. Unmet healthcare needs are generally low in EU countries, but low income households are five times more likely to report unmet needs than high income households. And this comes from Health at a Glance 2018 by OECD. So Access to healthcare remains a problem for many. One third of Dutch healthcare users find that healthcare currently not, is not affordable for themselves. Also differences in preventable and treatable causes. Mortality due to both preventable and treatable causes can be reduced in Europe. Preventable mortality is defined as death that could be avoided through public health and prevention interventions. And more than 1.2 million deaths could have been avoided in new countries in 2015 through better public health policies or more effective and timely healthcare, vaccines, tobacco, alcohol, the quality of acute care, cancer ma management are just some of the examples that can be tackled to reduce preventable mortality. To tackle these health problems, nurses need to be prepared for the, change, to the, for the changes in, this, in societies of the 21st century, of our century, well, finally. Some of these changes increase the need for care, such as an aging population. Uh, some are opportunities to expand the role. Some are beneficial. Some are simply going to change the way that we care. So we know these challenges. Four cate major categories of NCDs. Growing literacy of the population is a big challenge. Cultural diversity also a challenge and an opportunity. New health professions coming into the system, digital uh, communication and technology, robotics, climate change, plus the long forgotten threat of infectious diseases and epidemics. And who knows what else? Now, nurses uh, are looking to person-centered care, evidence-based care, 
expanding roles, working in a variety of settings and, and in people's homes, working in teams, uh, using digital tools, but they need even more clinical reasoning, decision making and intervention in complex situations. So not only the states of health in Europe, but also the global commitments that have been taken at the global uh, level. In 2015, the United Nations Assembly has adopted the 2013 Agenda for Sustainable Development, including 17 sustainable development goals and 169 targets. These goals, especially goal three, good health, and well-being can only be achieved through universal health coverage. And I would like to go a little into this concept. Uh, in 2017, the WHO Director General said all roads lead to universal health coverage. And this is our priority. Now, universal health coverage means all people have access to the health care they need when and where they need it without facing financial hardship. But it doesn't mean free access to every possible health service for every person. Every country has a different path to achieving universal health, covering and this, uh, health coverage and deciding what to cover based on the needs of their people and the resources it has, of course. It does, however, emphasize the importance of access to health services and information as a basic human right. While in poor countries, this could mean having a healthcare professional assisting delivery. In Europe, it can mean affordable access to dental and eye care, less waiting lists, access to palliative care, and so on. So, universal health coverage uh, has three main dimensions. Uh, the first dimension is the population covered by health services. So do we want to ex extend? To whom do we want to extend? Well, everybody, theoretically. The second one is um, services current coverage. What services should be considered basic and therefore covered for all. The third dimension has to do with the financial protection. How much do people have to pay out of pocket? And a fourth dimension is not represented but is recognized as critical for coverage to be effective is service quality. So to attain the triple billion targets, WHO proposes to achieve 1 billion more people benefiting from universal health coverage, 1, people more people, 1 billion more people better protected from health emergencies, and 1 billion more people enjoying better health and well-being. How has the EU progressed towards this, DGs? We have actually done quite well. And by the way, I invite you to search the Eurostat web page. It has, I was amazed to see how much information we can get in a very interactive way. So to all this, the contribution of nurses is unique. Yet nurses are often undervalued by the society, not well paid, have no perspectives for career progression, have no incentives or no support to pursue their professional development and education, work in understaffed units, are overloaded and suffer from burnout. More than 25% of nurses were dissatisfied with their job, according to the RN forecast study. And many nurses plan to leave the profession. Retention of nurses can be a problem, both in countries with high and medium income. So something, urgently needs to be done. Now that we have a picture of the nurses in Europe and we have a picture of the health challenges in Europe, let us then move on. And I'm approaching the end, don't worry. So, 
So these are some of the challenges that OECD has um, put on the table um, on the report Health at a Glance 2018. So focus on improving mental health across the lifespan, reducing wasteful spending, putting together, um, putting, to, putting a greater focus on preventing risk factor, factors and reduce premature mortality, and in ensuring universal access to care as critical to reducing health inequality. So how can we do this? Again, it cannot be addressed without a strong workforce in health. So the objectives of Health 2020 strategic policy framework for the European region are working to improve health for all and reducing the health divide and improving leadership and participatory governance, governance for health. So here you see that improving health service coverage uh, and uh, realizing the right to health does depend on health resources, on human resources availability, but also accessibility, acceptability and quality. Mere availability of health workers is not sufficient. So when there are shortages, you, we know that shortages in balance geographical distribution, inadequate technical and social skills, and inefficient utilization of health personnel impacts on health, equity, efficiency, quality, responsiveness, financial protection. We have been seeing this ever since this epidemic started. So the global strategy on human resources for health workforce 2030 focuses on optimizing the existing workforce, anticipating and aligning investment in future workforce, and strengthen individual and institutional capacity as well as strengthen data, evidence, and knowledge. We cannot move forward without data. It has already been stressed earlier. Nurses in the next decade need to change the vision of strengthened health systems that are more primary and community-based place a greater focus on health promotion, disease prevention, and tackling the social determinants of health, and provide high-quality, person-centered services accessible to all. They are concerned with all aspects of health, mental, physical, social, cultural, environmental, and spiritual. As these changes come about, nurses and midwives can play an even greater role in the future. The WHO strategy to strengthen nursing and midwifery has four priority areas. Scale up and transform education, plan workforce and optimize skill mix, create positive work environments and promote evidence-based practice and innovation. We could go slowly into each of these if we had the time, but we will just move very fast. There is evidence that education the educational level of nurses can have a major impact on mortality as well as other aspects of quality. Again, the RN forecast studies. Patient mortality is lower in wards where more nurses have bachelor's degrees. There is a trend to scale up the level of education, but this needs to be pushed further and we should do that. Besides, the higher the proportion of academically prepared nurses in a country, the more likely nurses are to be involved in decision making. These are some documents that uh, WHO has produced regarding education of nurses and midwives. Now, effective and high quality systems rely on multidisciplinary teams. So we need to strengthen the role of nurses and midwives and allowing them to work to their full potential. And this is a point that I would really like to stress. 
European evidence on the economic value of nurses remains scarce. We need to strengthen the evidence base for planning, monitoring, and accountability. We need to redesign existing services and introduce new and innovative services that maximize the contribution made by nurses and midwives, and again, enabling to them to work to the full extent of their license. I will now go back to the starting point to close. This report shows the relevance of investing in nursing. Better education, better jobs, and more leadership to participate in decisions is crucial for the development of a qualified and skilled nursing workforce that will contribute to strong health systems and for better health in Europe. Governments must see jobs for nurses and midwives, not just as cost, but as an investment in sustainable development. Nurses and midwives, and this is a quote from the Director General uh, of the WHO, nurses and midwives are not only essential for delivering health services, their experience and knowledge are also valuable assets in shaping health policy, and their voices deserve to be heard at the policy-making table. We are in a unique moment for nursing. Let us seize the moment. Thank you very much.